told them all my secrets. Oh. <laughs> so my accent is not where I'm from. Uh, so <laughs> I grew up in the... My accent is from Cambridge, distorted by six years in America. Um, I grew up in the, uh, in the Lake District, in the northwest of England. Oh, yeah. Tell yep. me. So my accent should be like this. But no, uh, not that. Oh, so okay. Wonderful. Um, I grew up at just outside of Kendall. There you go. <laughs> but no, um, but my both my parents are southerners, great to my great shame. Um, so, uh, yeah, I never had a very strong accent, and then I went to Cambridge and lost it. And if anything, since coming to the US, I've become posher and posher. I think it's just like needing to like live up to expectations. What do you do? I locally uh, recorded the food. And yeah, every look, every, everything. And uh, uh, Alicia, I think you met. Yeah. To cut out and upload to YouTube uh, with the interact and everything, except, I mean, no video. <laughs> oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. And then I can point that to my to my website and stuff. Yep, yeah, definitely. Uh, with the interactions and everything, uh, she will do as easy as possible. Editing <laughs> and everything else will be as time, but definitely. That's, that's the point. Or I can give it to you the whole recording while I'm doing it. If you have a pen drive, I can uh, give it to you. <laughs> uh, well, I have a pen drive that's big enough. But yeah, no, that would be oh, good. Your computer is big enough. <laughs> oh, your computer is uh, just getting it into it would be the. <laughs> we can manage it. We can manage it because I have a big R uh, one, so I can. Uh, that would be very useful, and then I can cringe at hearing my own voice. But it's, it's already uh, on, so. <laughs> oh, it's recording? Yeah, locally. Oh, okay. Locally. Oh, okay. Locally. Yeah. That's why usually um, early everything we receive as an event. And it's a local copy. If anything happens with any other copy, we have a local copy. Copies, yeah. That's that's just a backup of the backup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I um, my computer hard drive while I was traveling decided to break. So I got by and said, oh, no, it's fine. I backed up everything. Backed up everything. Great. My backup drive failed as it was trying to be attached. So okay. He's ready. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to exit this one. Hello. Oh, good morning. Happy sort of snow day. I don't know. Um, welcome to the seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Simon Locke. Simon went to Cambridge for his bachelor's and his master's and uh, left there in 2012 and then went to Harvard to work with Sarah Stewart for his PhD. He moved with Sarah to Davis um, and he graduated in 2018. His PhD features this new word, Senestia, which I'm sure you've heard Sarah speak about recently. Um, and now he's at um, Caltech, where he's got a fellowship, um, a planetary science option fellowship, right? Yep. Working with Paul Asmo um, and others. So um, welcome to Simon. Thank you for coming a little bit later this morning. And enjoy. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. This is. Uh, uh, it's going to be a really fun day. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so uh, as Nat said, today I'm going to talk to you um, about what was a large fraction of my PhD thesis. And what I'm going to try and convince you of is that we found a new way of forming the moon that can actually explain some of the key observational constraints that actually been a real struggle to explain uh, in some of our previous uh, theories. So we're going to start with Planetary Sciences 101, which is that Planets are formed by collisions. <laughs> so you start from a, a, a disk of gas and dust. That dust aggregates to form sort of clumps, sort of fluff balls. By some process we don't yet understand, uh, they, they somehow get combined together to make asteroid-sized objects, which collide together to make bodies the size of roughly about Mars. And it is the last stage of planet formation when these Mars-sized planetary embryos collide together which is a very fundamentally exciting part of planet formation, and is categorized by these collisions between these Mars-sized or larger bodies. And we refer to these things as giant impacts. Giant impacts are incredibly energetic events. During the first few hours of the impact, more energy is being released in a giant impact than released from the surface of the sun for over the same time period. 
And so, as you can imagine, this doesn't mean that the client's having a very good day. Uh, at the end of it, most uh, posting bodies are substantially vaporized. Uh, they're mostly molten. Um, and also, because of the large torque with giant impacts, they're also typically very rapidly rotating. So these are very significant events in a planet's history. But we have a particular interest uh, as far as we're concerned, because it is thought that one of these giant impacts, in fact, typically assumed to be the last giant impact that the Earth experienced as it grew, actually formed our planetary companion, the Moon. And basically, the, the rough idea of this has been around for 40 years. The idea is that an impact uh, pushes off material from the impactor and target into orbit, and that material accretes to form the Moon. And understanding this process is, is very important, not just for understanding uh, the formation of the moon, but it also is important for the Earth, because it sort of sets time zero for Earth's subsequent evolution. And so sets things like the partitioning of volatiles, uh, the structure of the mantle and core, uh, et cetera. So for about 20 of the last of the 40 years that we've had the giant impact hypothesis, the favored model for the origin has been the so-called canonical impact. And the way the canonical impact was sort of devised is that you take three key constraints of the Earth moon system. Firstly, you say that the angular momentum of the Earth moon system today was likely, you know, by your 101 physics, sort of conservation of angular momentum. The angular momentum we have now must have been the angular momentum we had back when the Earth first formed. You also need to reproduce, obviously, the mass of the Earth and the lunar disk. Um, and also, uh, Pony put a certain amount of iron in the moon to explain the low, the low iron content of the moon, or the moon's small core. And it was found by um, mo sort of uh, impact models, mainly by Robin Knupp, that you can actually only really do this over a very narrow set of parameters. And that is of a, of a Mars mass impactor hitting the Earth about the escape velocity at a grazing 45 degree impact angle. And over a very narrow range of parameters, you can actually get enough mass into orbit uh, to uh, potentially form the moon with the correct angular momentum. But obviously, that's not the end of the story. You've got mass into orbit, but you still actually have to form the moon. Um, and so this is a process that's actually relatively poorly understood and still a very much an, uh, an ongoing area of research. Because once you have got uh, mass into orbit, typically we assume that the mass in orbit is in a, in a sort of roughly Keplerian, a rotationally supported disk, and you have a planet, and you treat the, two, the evolution of the two separately. But really, the dynamics of how you form a moon from the disk it are, are very poorly unknown. And, and this is a wonderfully uh, in-depth paper as to how it uh, uh, looks at a lot of those problems and, un and uncertainties. Now, this has been sort of the default model, as I said, for over 20 years. But there are some key properties of the Earth moon system that we actually struggle to reproduce in the canonical impact model. The first of these is not one that we typically talk about, um, mainly because we, don't have, uh, we previously hadn't had a solution. And that is actually, in the canonical moon forming impact, it's very hard to produce a large enough moon, i.e. a moon that is the size of Earth's moon. Because if you look at all of the planets in the solar system, the Earth's, apart from Pluto and Sharon, which we can discount because it's not a planet, thank you, Mike Brown, um, we, uh, the moon is the largest mass fraction uh, from, of uh, its host planet than any other body uh, in the solar system. And the reason uh, this is, and so traditionally what we do to try and calculate the mass of the moon formed by giant impacts is we take the amount of mass and angular momentum that are put into the disk, and we use uh, scaling laws. So basically just lines that tell us I have this much mass, this is angular momentum, this is the mass of the moon that I form, generally produced by sort of separate simulations. Because we can't actually calculate the formation of the moon in our impact simulations. We use these to connect our impact simulations to the mass of the moon that we form. And so typically what people use is, are scaling laws that derive from n-body simulations. These are simulations where you basically just put point masses into orbit. You let them evolve under their self-gravity, and they accrete together to form moons. And this is probably the most uh, 
Uh, fundamentally, it's just a conservation of angular momentum exercise, and it is probably the most efficient way of actually forming a moon. So for you, a given uh, disk mass and angular momentum, you form the largest moon you possibly can. And what I'm plotting here is a fraction of all of the published uh, uh, canonical giant impact simulations from uh, various of Robin Knopp's papers, and the satellite mass you would infer to form using these n-body simulations. And what you can see is that there is a wonderful distribution, mostly above one uh, lunar mass. And so we can confidently assert that our, the canonical moon forming impact can actually form a lunar mass moon. However, the more complications we add to our disk models, the less and less efficient lunar accretion becomes. So if I take one slightly more uh, sophisticated uh, Moon form, uh, sort of moon formation uh, scaling law, which is from Salmon and Knopp, 2012, who tried to deal with some of the complications of, of having a, a vapor and condensate disk. What you find is there's actually only one impact in the entire database of uh, 100 and something odd canonical impacts that we have that actually forms a lunar mass moon. And the more and more uh, complications we add to our models, the less and less efficient moon moon formation becomes. So it's sort of worrying that we can't really get a lunar mass moon under the constraints of the canonical moon forming impact. So the second uh, issue is actually something that's not so much an issue with particularly the canonical impact, it's just a sort of unsolved issue with moon formation in general. And this is an observation that was made right back in the first days of an analysis of Apollo samples which is that the moon is very depleted in things uh, which we call moderately volatile elements. So what I'm showing you here is a plot from Ringwood and Kiesa in 1977, which shows the depletion factor relative to the Earth uh, of the moon. So anything up one here, the, um, the amount of that element in the moon is the same as in the Earth. Anything below one is depleted in the moon relative to the Earth. And what you can see is this is sort of very clear trend. As you go to increasing volatility, you are more and more deplete. These elements are more and more depleted in the moon relative to the Earth. And uh, and Ringwood and Keeson uh, in and Ringwood in subsequent papers basically sort of uh, inferred that this implies a high temperature origin in the moon. So you don't incorporate those more um, uh, those more uh, volatile elements. But actually matching this pattern of depletion in monetary volatile elements has actually not been done. There have been sort of a, uh, recently an attempt by uh, Robin Knopp and colleagues to try and uh, couple the chemistry and physics of, of a disk model to try and uh, reproduce the pattern. All they can get depletions in monetary volatile elements to actually match this pattern is, is uh, eluded them. So we cannot explain the moon's bulk geochemistry. The final one, which is one that you may be more familiar with, and has sort of, I suppose, fascinated the field for so at least the last 10, 15 years, is the observation that the Earth and the Moon are very similar in a broad range of stable and radiogenic isotopic signatures. So to explain that, if we look at pretty much every class of body we have sampled in our meteorite collections, they all have unique isotopic fingerprints in elements, things like oxygen, chromium, titanium, which sort of identify those uh, meteorites as coming from a particular parent body or group of parent bodies. And so we'd expect that Thea and the proto-Earth, so Thea is the, the wonderfully fancy name we give to the object that hit the Earth to form the moon, uh, would, have the same, would have very different isotopic fingerprints. And so in a canonical impact, most of the material that goes into forming the moon actually comes from the thing that hit the Earth. So we'd expect the moon to look like the thing that hit the Earth and not the same as Earth itself. However, this is not what we observe. So for example, here is a most, ring, uh, most recent in a series of papers looking at the uh, mass independent oxygen isotope difference between the Earth here in uh, sort of blue and red and the moon here in orange. And as you can see, 
the, the authors of this study uh, 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 claim that this was a resolvable one, I think one, two ppm offset uh, between the Earth and the Moon. Um, but as you can see, they're very, very similar. But the most similar differentiated body we have is out here is Albright's. And even if it was an Albright to hit the Earth with a canonical model, we still expect the Earth and the Moon to look uh, substantially more different in a canonical uh, impact. However, that's not the end of the story. Also recently in 2015, there was an additional observation which makes this an even more intriguing problem, which is as well as being very similar in their sort of isotopic fingerprints, things that are sort of set in based on the material the body accreted from, the Earth and the Moon are also very similar in tungsten isotopes. So this is a plot from Tobol et al. There's also a, a, a Kruger et al. paper on the same issue of nature. And what they're showing is that there is a, that the Earth here at zero in uh, uh, mu tungsten 182, uh, the Moon in this given dark gray band is slightly offset from the Earth, but this offset is almost entirely, is entirely accounted for in the late veneer of material to the Earth preferentially over the Moon, which means that initially when the Moon formed, the Earth and the Moon's tungsten isotopes had to have been very similar. And this is confusing because tungsten is not an indication of where material came from. It is an indication of the sort of the history of core formation on that body. And so even if you formed uh, uh, a body out of the same material, but they had slightly different pressure and temperatures of equilibration, timings of core formation, they would end up with very different tungsten isotopes. And so given that we're in a canonical impact, we have one body the size of uh, 0.9 uh, the size of Earth and one the size of Mars, you'd have expected those two to have very different core formation histories and therefore very different tungsten isotopes. But the result is that we have an Earth and the Moon that are indistinguishable within the era of the late veneer. So, these are the three, this is the field as it was when I started my, my thesis, which was we had some very difficult to explain problems and uh, we had just started exploring a series of solutions. And so there's been a variety of different attempts to try and reconcile almost exclusively the latter of those problems, the similarity in tungsten isotopes. So uh, originally, uh, Stan Jacobson, and then uh, sort of fleshed out more by Nicholas Defar, suggested maybe the impactor and the target were actually the same material. And they could actually have formed out of a similar inner solar system reservoir, and that's why you have isotopic similarity. However, you still then need to explain the tungsten isotopic similarity between the two bodies, because you'd still expect them to have different core formation histories, unless you just left it up to chance. And there is a small possibility that it could just be chance. But when scientists were never really happy with it just being a fluke. So um, no one was particularly satis satisfied with that explanation, certainly as far as the tungsten isotopes go. Uh, in 2007, uh, Kave Palavan and Dave Stevenson suggested that you maybe you could have exchange between the, the proto-Earth and the disk in the vapor atmosphere. However, in order to get to the level of isotopic homogeneity we need, you need to exchange a heck of a lot of material across a boundary that is um, uh, across a boundary without exchanging angular momentum, and you have to do it all in the vapor phase. And so this is, as written down, is probably not a feasible explanation uh, for for the isotopes. You could also, uh, more inventively, you could have multiple impacts and actually form the moon out of multiple different fragments of different bodies as you go through uh, accretion. And this is work that uh, was written in Rufo. Uh, uh, Roluca Rufu's work, but uh, Oded Aronson's group is fleshing out uh, in quite some detail. And finally, the thing that I think has really blown the field uh, open is the discovery in 2012 by Chukin Stewart and then subsequently confirmed by subsequent studies is that the fact that the angular momentum of the Earth Moon system we see today was not, is not necessarily the angular momentum of the system back when it first formed that actually there are various uh, ways, and there are now multiple different mechanisms, so you can take your lucky pick of different tidal interaction models that you'd like, where instead you, what you do is during the angular momentum, during the tidal evolution of the moon, you transfer angular momentum from the Earth-Moon system to the Earth-Sun system. So you basically push the Earth slightly further out in its orbit and reduce the rotation rate of Earth. 
And what this does is allows you to lose that first constraint that was used to define the canonical moon forming giant impact. And you can actually explore a much wider range of giant impacts to actually look at forming the moon. And so originally in 2012, uh, in the same paper, Chu Stewart 2012, and also Robin Knopp in a companion paper um, in the same issue, showed that there were different impact events. So Chu and Stewart showed that it's a very fast, rapidly rotating body with a small, fast, small impactor, or Robin Knopp showed that two half Earth masses merging would actually create a substantial amount of mixing between the two bodies and create a disk and a planet that had the same uh, sort of mixture of impactor and target material and so explain the uh, isotopic similarity. However, those particular impact parameters are actually rather unlikely. They would require very specific impacts. And so it's not, again, it's not a very high likelihood event that we'd end up with this similarity between the Earth and the Moon. And so this has sort of not made very many people uh, very happy. Now, this has sort of set the field as to where the field was before I started grad school as a nice, young, optimistic, uh, uh, fresh out of my master's in 2012. Uh, Sarah actually sent me this paper in the summer before I joined her, and it was just like, this is interesting. You should read this. Um, uh, but psychologists have assured me that you enjoy a story much better when you know the ending. So I'm just going to ruin it for you now uh, and say that what I'm going to show you today is that what people had been missing in those 2012 papers was that there is a range of high momentum, high energy impacts that actually produce an entirely different form of uh, a body, which we grandly called synestias, and I'll explain that name in a second, whether there are these massive bodies that are, are rotating or are hotter than a, uh, the co-rotation and form these massive or the Daily Mail termed mega space donuts. And these bodies are so large that the moon, instead of forming out of a disk of material outside of the body, actually forms inside the vapor of the terrestrial synestia, surrounded by bolt silicate earth vapor. And that this naturally explains both the moderately volatile um, depleted geochemistry of the moon. It uh, also helps explain the isotopic similarity between the Earth and the Moon. And obviously, a requirement of this, uh, in terms of how you wrote it down, was that you need to have, afterwards, angular momentum transferred from the Earth-Moon system to the Earth-Sun system, as has been shown by a variety of different studies. So I've now I've ruined the ending. You can go to sleep. Uh, but those of you who want to know what a synestia is, you need to like actually keep listening. So we're going to play a slight thought experiment which is what is the structure, what do hot, rapidly rotating planets look like? So in order to do this, I'm going to show you a series of these diagrams. So what this is, is just a cut through, per, um, perpendicular to, sorry, parallel to the rotation axis of bodies that are all going to be, all going to be Earth mass and composition, but with varying mantle-specific entropies, which I know is everyone's favorite unit, and different angular momenta. So what this specific entropy basically means is that for this body with an angular momentum equal to the present day Earth-Moon system, so that's uh, the units we're going to be using throughout this talk, what you have is you have a nice spherical planet. Uh, and these colors are just pressure. Uh, they're not particularly important, just to sort of show you what's going on. But for this entropy, that body is basically entirely molten. It has a potential temperature of about 4,000 Kelvin and would have a negligible silica vapor atmosphere. Um, so, and, and all of these are outputs from smooth particle hydrodynamic calculations, which is the same code we use to calculate impacts, except we've just used it to sort of create isolated planets, um, uh, which I'm sure is not what the designers of that code originally intended. Um, so let's start. What happens if I start heating up this body that has a relatively low rotation rate. This is still rotating at about five hours. But for now, just re-address uh, re, uh, your brain, that slow rotation. Okay. Uh, what happens if I heat this up? And it does exactly what you would expect. As you heat it up, because we're actually starting quite hot, uh, 
as you move to ent uh, specific entropies that are closer to the critical point, you start to vaporize the surface, and the whole thing increases in volume and expands until it looks like a giant puffball. But it would still look sort of like a giant planet. There's no surface to this body. It is just uh, about a factor of two larger than the Earth and just a giant silicate ball of gas. But what happens if we do the same exercise, instead starting with a body that is, uh, has a much higher angular momentum? So this body has a rotation period of about 2.5 hours. And as you can see, because of that very rapid rotation, the uh, shape of the body is very distorted. In this case, the equatorial radius is almost twice the polar radius for this body, and it can actually be somewhat more extreme than that. To show you what's about to happen, I'm going to add another plot on the bottom, which is angular velocity as a function of radius. And each of the points, which you can't actually see, but these are individual points, are individual SBH particles in the mantle of this body. So what you can see is here in this body, all of the uh, particles, all of the mantle is, is rotating at the same angle of velocity. So it's all rotating together like a planet, as we'd expect. Um, and then out here, this red line is the angle of velocity you'd, have, you'd expect if you were on a purely Keplerian orbit, a purely rotationally supported orbit around the planet. Now what happens if we start heating this planet up is something fundamentally different to what happened in the previous case. What happens is the planet still expands, but it expands to the point where the equatorial, uh, the equator of the planet intersects the Keplerian orbital velocity. Now, you can't keep expanding and remain co-rotating. You would need a positive pressure gradient, which is uh, unphysical. You need something holding the planet together to keep it co-rotating. So what happens is the outer edge of the planet ends up forming a sort of a disk-like region outside of it, but that is continuously connected to the inside uh, of the body. And it's for this, and we looked at this <laughs> for a very long time and worked out that we were actually looking at something very different in the giant impact simulations. And so we gave this type of body a name, and the name we gave it is Synestia. And this is uh, Syn, meaning together, and Hestia, who is the goddess of architecture and often associated with houses and the hearth, which you have very loosely interpreted as structure. So this means together structure, to highlight the fact that your co-rotating region and your disk light region are not two separate sections, not two separate structures, but actually one continuous body. And you'll see why this is, is important for moon formation in a second. Now, if we continue this uh, uh, exercise and keep heating this body up, it starts to get pretty huge. Um, and you have, again, you still continue to have a continuous structure with a more massive disk-like region and a co-rotating region inside of that. Now, we can play this game over a whole range of different angular momenta and different uh, specific entries, so different thermal states. And what I'm showing you here are all Earth mass planets. But what you can see is that they can, with changing their entropy, so heating up from left to right, and increase their angular momentum from top to bottom, you can end up with a whole range of structures, from that big puffy silicate gas giant I showed you before, to the oblate uh, uh, spheroid here, to these massive puffed out synestias in this bottom right-hand corner. And importantly, although these are all idealized planets that we sort of just made up to illustrate this, this point, giant impacts both heat you up and make you spin uh, rapidly. And so you end up in this bottom right-hand corners with this very sort of puffed out structures. And just for reference here, this red line here is what we call the co-rotation limit. The boundary which would be this side of which, the low angular momentum, low entropy side, you can remain a single co-rotating body. And on the right-hand side of this, there is no way you can get all of this mass at this thermal state into a co-rotating body. It has to be a synestia or divide into two different bodies. Cool. So I hope you now all appreciate why we came up with a different name. Uh, <laughs> to basically emphasize that this is a very different structure to what we're used to thinking about with plants. And so that leads me on to the, uh, to the question of, OK, so we have this very different structure. How does that affect how the moon forms? 
So throughout this entire exercise, um, what we are trying to do is link the physical conditions under which the moon is forming to the geochemistry of the moon. Because we're trying to make that link between, uh, the, uh, between the physics and the geochemistry. And so our approach to this was trying to determine the pressure, temperature, composition paths of the material that ends up forming the moon. And so throughout all of this, what we're going to be doing is talking about those pressures and temperatures uh, uh, linked in the formation process. So what I'm going to show you, to show you how a moon forms from this sort of structure, is I'm going to again show you the same sort of plot I've been showing, except instead of being an idealized planet that I just made up, this is actually the output of a giant impact simulation. This is a synestia that was formed, um, I think in this case, between a collision between a sort of 0.45 and a 0.55 Earth mass body. And what you have here is you have a massive synestia that is fully vapor all the way out to this black line. Only outside this black line is any amount of condensate stable. Any melt that is in this region is rapidly vaporizing, if it's small. Um, and what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you how the moon forms from such a structure. Because what is happening is at the surface, you have this very hot silicate vapor that is radiatively cooling to space at about 2,300 Kelvin. And what this does is all of that energy is going into condensing silicate rain. And so you end up with a torrential rain of silicate droplets. The rain rate at the surface of the synestia is an order of magnitude greater than the highest rain rate that's been observed on Earth. So this is not a place to go on holiday. Um, uh, and what that does is that rain uh, falls into the center of the structure, starts to re-vaporize. The stuff that doesn't see anything else ends up falling and just basically re-vaporizes and adds its mass back into the vapor. However, material that ends up being accreted to, some to something larger ends up uh, sort of being, uh, uh, that larger body has a much larger surface, sorry, much smaller surface area to volume ratio. And so things that are a good fraction of a lunar mass can actually survive with limited vaporization for tens to hundreds of years in the surrounding of the synesia. So if you're a droplet, you have two choices. One is that you die, and the other is that you join the collective and uh, uh, form a moon uh, somewhere in the midplane of this body. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you this process happening. Um, the two, I'm going to give you two different approximations of what the mass and position of the moon would be. One is this black circle, which is to scale. So this is the size of the moon as it grows relative to the whole thing. And this blue triangle is another approximation of the moon. Because right now, we can't, quite, we can't model the sort of small scale physics that's going on with the large scale. And so we have to make an assumption as to how much of that rain that is condensing actually falls to the moon and how much of it falls in. So the black line, the black circle is sort of a minimum estimate. This is the minimum mass of the, a rough, weak, lower bound on the, on the minimum mass of the moon, and also the furthest out position-wise that the moon's going to be. Whereas the blue diamond is an attempt to try and more realistically include some of the, uh, more of the falling condensates. So again, on the left is just going to be the evolution of the pressure structure. On the right here, as a function of time, I'm going to show you the, uh, the mass of the two estimates for the moon, both the black and the blue estimate for the moon. This one, yay. Uh, so <laughs> what you can see here is that you get it with rapid growth of the moon. But the moon is initially growing surrounded by tens of bars of silicate vapor. So it is growing inside the body. And one thing I forgot to mention was that everything about the simulation is chosen when we had a choice in terms of how to parameterize the physics to make this the fastest possible evolution of the structure. So in this case, what happens is the whole synestia is shrinking as it loses pressure support. More of the material falls out as condensate. As it shrinks, the moon is left in its position, just emerges from the structure after sort of uh, a few years. And after, uh, as we continue to cool, eventually this blue estimate for the moon will also emerge from the structure. And so what you've had is they had this very rapid evolution 
of the terrestrial synestia, which has sort of formed a moon and then just left it behind as the rest of the vapor has contracted and eventually over hundreds to thousands of years that the leftover vaporized uh, body will become something we would recognize as, as the Earth. So this is a very different environment for lunar formation than from a canonical disk. What we have is we have a body forming inside a silicate vapor atmosphere of tens of bars. So what does that moon look like? So the chemistry of the moon is set by an exchange between the condensate of the, of the uh, growing moon, which is originally a lunar seed and eventually the fully grown moon, with the BSE vapor around it, so bulk silicate earth vapor around it, through some kind of uh, uh, boundary layer. And what we have inferred to happen is that we think that the, the moonlet is in equilibrium, the very surface of the moon is in equilibrium with the BSE vapor through the process of condensation and evaporation at this boundary layer. And so we can attempt to use equilibrium, uh, we can take the approximation that this is set by the equilibrium thermodynamics of bulk silicon earth material and actually try and predict what the composition of the moonlet would be in this scenario. So from the uh, SPH simulations, we have the pressure. How can we can constrain the temperature? So as I mentioned before, anything uh, anything that is, any droplets that are forming at the surface of the Senestia are forming down here at 2,000 or so Kelvin. And what I'm showing you here is the mass fraction of different elements, the colored lines, or the total mass fraction in this black dotted line as a function of temperature for bulk silicate earth equilibrium uh, at 20 bars. So this is sort of a representative pressure for the vapor surrounding the moon and the Senestia. And what you can see is that high temperature, everything is vaporized. Everything is in the vapor phase. But as you go to lower temperatures, first the uh, more refractory elements, things like uh, um, aluminum, silicon, iron, condense out. And then eventually at lower uh, pressures, the uh, uh, sodium and potassium also start to condense out until you're left down here with just solid and vapor-dominated species. Uh, sorry, volatile-dominated species. Um, so if I'm forming my uh, condensates at the surface of the Senestia down here at 2,500 Kelvin, um, and they fall into the uh, higher pressure regions of the structure, the small, uh, small droplets just fall straight through and revaporize. But if, you, if they get accreted to a larger body, what happens is that body is trying to vaporize. It's way out of, uh, it is losing, uh, it's being heated by the vapor around it and it's being heated up. But what you can see is there is a very sudden increase in the evaporation rate around the point at which about 10% of the silicon is in the vapor. And so what happens is larger bodies that are getting heated up get stuck at this uptick in the vapor, uh, uh, in, in the rate of evaporation or uh, vaporization. And so for a very long period of time, for tens of years, they are stuck around this transition in vaporization rate. And so we can use this temperature combined with our pressure estimates from the, um, from the SPH simulations, we can take our temperatures from this, what we're calling a silicate vaporization buffer, which will give us our pressures and temperature conditions for, uh, that sets the composition of the moon. It's just latent heat of evaporation. So basically, it's just that, so the latent heat of uh, vaporization is what, two or three orders of magnitude greater than the latent heat of melting. And so basically, it just takes so long to get enough energy into the body to vaporize any significant mass when the mass that's being vaporized is the major constituent species. Yeah. No, no, go for it. So um, the core, most of the core material is just taken into the core of the Earth. In most impacts, most of the material just very quickly merges into it. We have taken a bulk silicate Earth composition. There could be an enhancement in iron from material that has been added to uh, the outer regions or just the whole Senestia that will later go out to the core. Uh, 
we've just taken the assumption as that amount is sort of poorly constrained just to take the simplest end member and just assume it's bulk silicate earth. The other way of saying it is we end up with bulk silicate earth. So presumably what we had was also pretty similar to bulk silicate earth. So it kind of goes round in circles. And we're good. So we now have our pressure and temperature of equilibration. What, so what is the uh, composition of the moon you actually get by equilibrating on that pressures and temperatures? So I'm going to show you a similar plot to what I showed you before, which is the, uh, the composition of the moon normalized the bulk silicate earth. Um, and because I'm pretending to be a geochemist, doubly normalized aluminum. So on this plot, aluminum is by definition 1. But everything else, if you are lower than 1, you are depleted in the moon relative to the Earth. And what this gray band is showing you here is the range of reasonable estimates for the composition of the moon. So there is, a, as you can see, for some elements, it's rather uncertain, um, because it's very hard to tell from a handful of Apollo samples uh, some of the composition of some of these uh, rarer elements. But what, you can, what we can do is we can compare this range of approximations for the bulk lunar chemistry with the pressure, with the compositions you would get by equilibrating at the silicate vaporization buffer at a range of temperatures. And what we find is that we end up with a range of different compositions that is particularly sensitive around, uh, obviously, the transition to more moderately volatile elements. But at the pressures that we infer, sort of tens of bars, in the vapor uh, that we expect equilibration to happen, at, in the Senestia, what we find is we end up with a very good match to the range of estimates for the bulk lunar composition. And what you can see is if we go to too lower pressure, uh, to, to higher pressure, i.e. this black line, we start to go out of the range of estimates. And particularly if we go to too lower pressures, so even down as far as 5 bar and certainly as low as 1 bar, we end up uh, substantially over depleting in various moderately volatile so what we, can, what we can say is that forming a moon inside the Senestia after a high momentum, high energy impact can actually reproduce the bulk chemistry of the moon. And this is the first time that anyone's actually been able to uh, sort of do that. But let's return to our other two problems. What about the isotopic similarity between the Earth and the moon? So in this case, the moon is, uh, is forming from and is equilibrating with bulk silicate earth vapor. The outer portion of this, of this uh, synestia is mixing very rapidly, driven by both uh, thermal convection, but also substantially, and particularly in terms of radial convection, by the, uh, the torrential rain of condensates from the photosphere. Because they can travel very long distances before um, vaporizing in, in sort of these large downwellings. And what that does is if you, you can mix a large fraction of the Senestia in the, on the order of weeks when your moon formation time is in the order of years. And so what you expect to have is a moon that looks similar to uh, the outside portions of the Celestia. And so this definitely helps because you're mixing a large fraction of the mass. You can help explain the isotopic similarity between the Earth and the moon. But sadly, it is not the silver bullet to everything. Because, and this is something that I, I feel I have to say, because um, people often say, but you've solved this. I'm like, no, I've just made it slightly easier. Um, the impactor and the target to explain the stable uh, uh, isotopes, such as oxygen, titanium, uh, chromium, those isotopic fingerprints, the impactor and the target still have to have been somewhat similar to each other. You can't have a Mars-like mass, Mars body impact the Earth because you, the fraction of the body you would need to actually mix and equilibrate is way too large. Now, this sort of mixing may be sufficient to explain tungsten, and we're working on quantifying that. Um, but it helps rather than completely magically solves. And the reason for that is that it is very difficult to mix the entire body. And that is for two reasons. One um, is that the whole thing is very rapidly rotating. And to mix radially in this structure is quite hard, because you have to overcome 
the impedance, uh, the angular momentum uh, transfer problem. But the second is a bit easier to, to quantify, which is that the whole post-impact body is very highly stratified. The inner parts of the body are much colder than the outer parts. And the way I'm going to show you this is, again, using my favorite thermodynamic variable, so specific entropy. So up is hotter, down is colder, as a function of radius in the midplane of a canonical impact and uh, an example potential moon-forming synestia. So what you have here is you have a lot of your mass in the lower mantle is relatively cold, close to the liquidus. And then you have a very steep rise in the thermal, um, in, the, in the specific entropy of these bodies. And so in order to mix material from out here down into the lower mantle requires you to both overcome rotation, but also overcome a fantastically steep thermal gradient. And actually doing that is very, going to be very difficult, even with the aid of rain. And to illustrate that, because we have rain, which is driving mixing in the outer portions, the mixed phase regions of the body, we can try and approximate what fraction of the outer portions of the body uh, would mix based on that that's above the critical point specific entropy. And so what I have here is the mass fraction of a body that could easily mix as a function of the specific impact energy, so more energetic impacts to the right. The colors here are just the impactor mass fraction, so the ratio of the mass of the impactor to the mass of the, uh, uh, sorry, the radius, the fraction of the mass of the projectile over the total mass in the system. So point uh, 0.5 here is a two half Earth masses colliding. Uh, point 0.1 here is something similar to the canonical uh, impact. And what you can see is that as you get to higher and higher entropy, you vaporize more and more of your body. And so you end up with a larger mass fraction that's available to mix. And in the most extreme cases, half the body could be easily mixed, could mix, completely homogenize that 50% of the mantle but it's still not always going to be good enough in all situations. So people have tried to estimate the isotopic similarity between the, the uh, proto-Earth and Thea, the thing that hit us, using a variety of different techniques. What I'm going to show you is results from one particular study by Young et al., 2016. And what uh, they showed is that in order to explain the isotopic similarity in oxygen isotopes between the Earth and uh, the, the moon, in 40% of impacts, uh, of final impacts, uh, the, uh, potential moon forming impacts, if you could mix so that the fraction of the uh, impactor in the moon is uh, only 0.1 different, this unit doesn't really matter, than that in the rest of the synestia, 40% of your impacts would be able to reproduce the isotopic similarity if you can fall into this box, into this box. If you're not that good and you can only get to 0.2, only 20% of your impacts would actually reproduce the isotopic similarity between the Earth and the Moon in oxygen isotopes. And what we see is if we take all of our impacts and plot them on this plot, there are actually relatively few impacts that get down to there being a particular chance of there um, being a similar enough uh, impactor and target to actually explain the isotopic similarity in the Earth and Moon. Now, I should point out that this big clump of blue ones down here, which you say, aha, they work. They were all from the Chuk and Stewart 2012 study that was deliberately fine-tuning the impact to try and reproduce isotopic similarity. So these are actually relatively uh, uh, not unlikely, but they're uh, very targeted studies. And actually, this rain, more range of more multicolored spots here is more typical of the range that we see uh, during giant impact. So very few of our impacts would actually pro uh, produce an isotopic similar Earth and the Moon. So we still need some, uh, we need still some mechanism that the impactor and the target were not too different in their isotopic um, signatures. So finally, the mass of the Moon. Now this is actually quite straightforward. You have a more energetic impact, you have more angular momentum, you can get more mass into orbit. Uh, and so actually with these uh, high momentum, high energy impacts, there is a whole variety of different impacts that produce, get enough mass into orbit, even mass beyond the Roche limit, to actually form a lunar mass moon. So, to summarize, uh, 
what we have found is that a range, and I should stress this, a range, it's not just the two n-member cases of the, the 2012 papers of a two half Earth masses or a rapidly rotating pre-impact body and a small fast impactor. There is a whole range of different impacts between those two that can force the proto-Earth to become a synestia. And that by becoming a synestia and forming a moon inside the vapor of that synestia at tens of bars and thousands of Kelvin, you can actually reproduce the moderately volatile element depletion of the moon. You can also potentially help explain the terrestrial-like isotopic composition of the moon. Finally, for this model to work, you then have to have angular momentum uh, removal by tidal evolution later uh, after the formation of the moon itself. However, this isn't really the end of the story. After the moon forming impact, your, your, the proto-Earth, even after the moon has formed, is still a massive ball of, uh, of, of vaporized silicate. It looks more like a silicate gas giant than it would a planet. And so there is an important period of transition from immediately after the formation of the moon down to something that looks like the Earth as we know it today. And this is a very dramatic change, both in the thermodynamics, in the rotational dynamics of the body. And actually, this is a little bit misleading. It should more look like this. This is more of your size change. Um, and there are lots of this, parts of this period that have actually been not really considered any depth, partly because we didn't realize they existed. Um, and what I'm doing going forward is actually trying to see what processes are happening during this period and trying to link that physics to the geochemical observation. So as well as using those sort of traditional observations we've used to try and determine between different uh, uh, lunar formation scenarios, whether there's anything else that we can learn from different evolutions between the uh, canonical or high angular momentum or, or another potential moon forming scenario that can actually help us test those models and infer things for the, for the present day. And I was toying between two given talks, so I'm just going to give you an example of, of what, oop, that's blanking the screen, let's try that, uh, of one of those potential things. So here at the Geophysical Lab, and I suppose at DTM as well, you care a lot about pressure. We all care a lot about pressure. And so one of the things that's really uh, important is that the pressure after giant impacts is not what you think it is. So I'm putting it up there. So just to show you that, um, and this is mostly a plug for a paper that I'm just about to send back uh, reviews for, so we can talk about this more later. But this is the core mantle boundary pressure. Um, and what I'm going to show you is uh, our collection of smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations plotted as a function of the angular momentum of the body after the moon forming impact. So this is in units of the angular momentum of the present day Earth moon system. Now, just to reference yourselves, uh, this point here is where the present day Earth is at using all of these simulations. And this bar is giving you the range of pressures for bodies from 0.9 to 1.1 Earth masses with the same angular momentum as the present day Earth, uh, because that is the range of mass of post-impact states I will be showing you. Whereas this bar over here is the same bodies, but for an angular momentum equivalent to the Earth-Moon system today. And what we find is that the pressure in the, in the core mantle boundary after giant impacts can be substantially lower than the present day Earth. These are all roughly Earth mass bodies, and yet we can have pressures down to less than half the pressure of the core mantle boundary today. And what this does is, as, I've, as some insightful people have already guessed this morning, is that this is potentially a way of, because this happens not just after the moon forming giant impact, but after every single giant impact, your pressures are depressed relative to a slowly rotating condensed planet. And so this is a potential way to reconcile observations of moderately sigefile elements in the mantle, but also significantly for, uh, uh, for high momentum moon forming impacts. The pressures in the mantle after your impact are actually low enough to preclude the formation of a basal magma ocean which is a significant difference between a canonical model, which is here, where you have similar pressures to the present day, and high momentum, ca high momentum cases. And that could potentially be a way of, of looking at different implications of these different models uh, for the, the mantle geochemistry and thermodynamics. And finally, 
if you're starting down here, you have to get back up here somehow. And during that process, you're driving huge pressure increases, which can cause phase transitions, melting, freezing, all sorts of very interesting uh, things. So this is where we're going with this. We're now turning back to look at the Earth and see what happened to the Earth after you formed the moon. So thank you. So um, it is, this is being driven by both temperature and pressure. So um, I don't, unfortunately, have this plot in the slide deck. So this is obviously showing, um, so the way we're tying the pressure and the temperature together, I should probably start there, is we're saying that we know the pressure from our SPH simulations. We know the, the pressure of vapor in which the moon is forming at from those thermodynamic simulations. Now, with that pressure, we know that the, uh, the, the moon is forming in that pressure. And when the moon is forming, it's starting on the liquid side of the liquid vapor phase boundary. And it's being heated by the vapor around it. So for this plot, it is starting down here at sort of 2,000 Kelvin or so, and it's being heated. But you get stuck at the point you start to substantially vaporize. Because the latent heat of vaporization is so high, it would take you literally tens to hundreds of years to vaporize this, to vaporize, vaporize a significant fraction of this body. And so the temperature just of the surface just gets stuck around this uptick in, in silicate, uh, basically it's dictated by silicon uh, vaporization. And so what we can do is we can take that pressure, or actually just a range of pressures, and take this temperature of this, on, of this uptick in silicate vaporization, which just, uh, for simplicity, we can just take as about 10% of the silicon in the vapor, and we can then plot what that composition is at various different pressures. And so, yes, as you can see here, the where different elements are condensing and vaporizing is dependent on their temperature, but the relative vaporization temperatures is dictated by pressure. So both things matter. So, so one of the nice things about this is that it's not actually, we don't actually care about the relative uh, value of temperature because all that matters is the relative behavior of the different elements. So actually, the, the exact values of temperature I give in this plot, I don't actually care too much about because the composition is controlled by the relative behavior of elements on the phase diagram. So yes, you're right. There are, we've had to make, to, in order to calculate this higher temperature, you have to make extrapolations from uh, experimental data. And we try and do that in the most robust way you can. But what's important is the relative behavior of different elements rather than actually the exact temperatures that you, you extrapolate to. OK, so um, uh, the straightforward answer to that question is don't know. Uh, so there are two components to that, um, which is that in order to form a synestia that is substantial enough to produce a moon, you need both a high energy impact and a high angular momentum impact. So the first of those we can actually do really well. And actually what we find is that most impacts experienced a handful of impacts that are enough to produce substantial, that are high enough energy to produce enough vapor to form a synestia if they are high enough angular momentum. And so most impacts uh, become vapor, most planets become vaporized silicate puffballs at least once during their formation. Now, the second question is much harder to answer because currently, from a physics point of view, we don't really have the tools to address the question of how angular momentum of planets evolves through formation. And that's for two reasons. One 
is that we don't have a good scaling law for um, what the angular momentum of bodies is after giant impacts, and sort of trying to put that into an end body simulation to accrue that forward. And the second, well, there's three actually. The second is that we don't, a lot of the angular momentum goes into small bodies, and we don't track those in end body simulations. And the third is that we have a massive uncertainty in how efficient the formation of moons are. And because obviously, if you form a moon, it tidally evolves out between impacts. It takes away angular momentum from the primary, and therefore you have less angular momentum to start with when you have your next collision. Now, the best estimates that have been done to date uh, were a paper by Kakuba and Gender in 2010. And what they found is the average angular momentum, or the, the median angular momentum of Earth mass bodies, was 2.7 times the present day Earth mean angular momentum at the end of their simulations. And so we'd expect that all, most terrestrial planets will be very rapidly rotating at the end of formation. So actually a high angular momentum is actually more, in some ways more likely than the present day uh, Earth moon angular momentum, although that's a. So uh, I think we can all agree this is sort of a, a big open question. I can give you my uh, favorite uh, model. So this is a model that's been suggested by a number of, of people, I think written down by Seth Jacobson, um, that in end body simulations, you can have a dichotomy between the larger bodies to the left at the end of the simulation. So one of those can experience a late giant impact, and one of those experiences its last giant impact while it's still only uh, sort of 0 0.8, 0 0.7 the mass of its final mass. And so if you are having your last giant impact when you've still got a lot of mass to grow, one is that if you form a satellite, there's a high chance of that satellite being perturbed and ejected from, from orbit. Uh, and the second is that um, the addition of mass by smaller bodies I, isotropically around a different impact angles will increase your moment of inertia without increasing your uh, angular momenta. And so you potentially can end up both losing angular momentum to your satellite, but also losing angular momentum. You also just slow your rotation by growing uh, by small bodies. That might not be the correct, but that, I think that's a, a good explanation as to why you might have two very different bodies in the, in the same system. But I'm agnostic on this point. I'm sort of very open to any alternative explanations. <laughs> Agreed, but actually what they found is that it's actually not that small a fraction of their, of their M-body simulations, as imperfect as M-body simulations are, that end up with this sort of dichotomous relationship. And I, I suppose the thing I struggle with is, is in all the arguments that come down to chance, is that what we're looking at is a very special system, and what we're looking at is a very special planet. Earth is unique in our solar system, and the only other body that's anywhere near like it is Venus. So we have two Earth-like bodies, and they're very different. And so actually trying to infer likelihood from those, as you say, we don't like saying that one is just different by chance. But in some ways, they kind of have to be. They're just two grab bags out of the statistical distribution of planets. And we don't actually yet, hopefully exoplanets will get there, we don't yet understand what that grab bag actually is uh, and actually contains. Um, we think very small, although not everyone would necessarily agree with this, because your atmosphere is silicate dominated, it's very heavy, so it's not uh, susceptible to hydrodynamic escape because it's bound by a very large mass, it's still in the Earth's gravitational potential well. It doesn't last very long, so you don't have much high integration time, it's only um, hundreds to thousands of years before you condense your silicate vapor. And the other thing is, if you start to try and lose vapor from the atmosphere, it just condenses, because you're silicate dominated. Um, so we think it's small. No one is actually currently modeling the anaphoric escape from con fully condensable atmospheres. So that's a sort of an interesting question going forward. So um, at the pressures and temperatures in the outside of the synestia, the iron is Missable with the silicate. So you don't have a separate metal and silicate phase. They're just all one continuous fluid. Now, as you go to higher pressures or you cool, the two become uh, immiscible again and you would have separation of the two. Um, now, unfortunately, the calculations that we've, uh, I've shown you are 
are ideal, and so that you can only go to very modest pressures, 100 bars, and even then you're probably pushing it slightly. Um, and so we don't really understand that separation beyond those pressures. And so what, what we find is that if we take the, the lunar composition at, say, 10 bars and evolve it forward, it precipitates out iron out of about 2%, which is kind of convenient for moon formation. But obviously, that's not happening at 10 bars. It's happening at uh, the pressures in the interior of the moon. And so the core formation on the moon after or even during its formation is a very interesting problem, particularly when you're talking about tungsten and things like moderate pseudophile elements. You also potentially have some element of core formation later on after the moon has formed in the Earth itself. Um, because as you cool, things that were immiscible might become immiscible. Whether that's a significant mass, whether it's a significant mass fraction of the mantle is also still an open question. I think that the, co the dynamics of core formation on both bodies afterwards is really interesting and potentially a very strong constraint because we have the similarity in tungsten, so we can't actually do too much to perturb it. So I think that if you could somehow, in 10 years, 20 years' time, once you, understood, you thought you understood it enough, you could actually use that process as a constraint to say what the evolution pathways of those two bodies could be. Yes, this is this is coming back. So, agreed. It cannot the 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 equilibration on the two bodies cannot be too different because you upset your your hafnium and tungsten. If you can, the the radio the radiogenic the one eighty two tungsten is, but the hafnium tungsten bulk composition could still be altered, right? And people, I mean, if you can find me two geochemists that agree on what the hafnium and tungsten ratio of the moon is then I'll be very happy. Um, but th that potentially is, is another coming back into that. It, it's another worry, just that sort of bulk uh, hafnium tungsten is, is interesting. And then you talk about timing as to whether you're dead or not quite dead. Um, it's interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so this is so I, I don't think um, I don't necessarily agree with Oded Aronson about uh, the multiple giant impact hypothesis that he is uh, him and his group put forward. But one of the nice things about them pursuing that is that they're answering these sort of questions. Um, and so there is a paper recently by Citron et al. I think it was last year or maybe early this year, which is looking at this problem. If I have if I have a moon, it tidally evolves outwards then I have another impact and form another moon, what is the likelihood of those two surviving? And so what happens is basically you almost never end up with just two moons hanging around. They either eject or merge, or one gets pushed into the Earth. Um, now, the likelihood of one being ejected gets higher and higher as the closer the other moon is. And so what matters is the time between the impacts. Um, and so that's an interesting question. I think that most people assume that the tidal parameters of the Earth and the Moon are such that any Moon that would have been formed would probably have been pushed far enough out that it would, uh, between impacts on the typical time scale of millions, tens of millions of years, that it wouldn't necessarily be inside the Synestia when it formed. Now, we actually don't understand tidal parameters of molten or partially molten planets to within several orders of magnitude. So, that's not necessarily the case. And so you could potentially envision a situation where you ended up with uh, forming a moon and then having another, another impact that engulfed it. That's potentially more likely in, thing, in uh, hit and run events. So hit and run events, it's one of the really cool things when we started talking about this at meetings. Someone, uh, Travis Gabriel, who works with Eric Ashfog, doing Mercury formation hit and runs. They find synestias formed by hit and run events. So you have Mercury forming with, a, with the thing that hit Mercury being a synestia. Um, and so those sort of things 
because the, the impact comes back round on orbital timescales, years, tens of years, you could have one impact, it could form a synestia, it could start to cool, precipitate our moon, and then have another impact onto the same body, and you, you wouldn't, you'd re-energize the synestia or, or, or form another one if it got that far, which could potentially then re-engulf. So there's all sorts of interesting, that was a very long answer, but uh, very interesting probabilities with multiple impacts and the tidal deviation of multiple, of multiple moons, which is, is fun to look at, particularly for exosystems where these things, instead of hanging around for hundreds to thousands of years, can hang around if they're volatile dominated, things like ice dominated, they can hang around for millions, hundreds of millions of years. And so, sort of interesting. 